I've um, gone through some professional development things over the year uh, online, and one of them did say that it's in a way it's harder to hold people hold people's attention on this medium because you're not with them, so they can't you know get the energy and all of this. But um, I actually think it. So they were saying like error on the side of more slides rather than less, which I thought was interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, so but for this kind of talk, it's different where like you're reminiscing about somebody and, you know. Um, so, Daryl, maybe if you could push back a tiny bit now that I put you on the big screen. Um, can you see yourself like you're a little bit cut I, off? I can. How is that? Because it's a little hard for us to tell from this. Yeah, side. Howard, exactly. If you scooch over a tiny bit and then you come closer to him, if you don't mind. I know the social distancing. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. That's okay. We've both been vaccinated. Oh, good, good. Yeah, How's yeah. That? Is that a little that, better? That's good. Yeah. Just one eye is a tiny bit out of. So either shift your cam. You know, you can shift your laptop a bit yourself. No, the other. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Now you're both in. That's beautiful. There we go. Look at the production values on this. <laughs> so remember, um, I was a print reporter, not a camera person. Uh, yeah, I know. Well, <laughs> we've had to learn so many new skills. You know, it's crazy. So we'll start. I think, even though. Um, as I say, probably more people will jump on in a, in a couple of minutes. So welcome everyone to the Irish American Heritage Museum's Zoom presentation with Daryl McGrath and um, Howard Healy. We're talking tonight about Daryl's husband, Jim McGrath, who was a writer and editorial writer for the Times Union here in Albany and um, died, you know, kind of suddenly quite young at 56 years of age in 2013. So Daryl and Howard are going to take us through some of his op-ed essays and writings, uh, critiques that are housed in the book, I'll Be Home. And of course, tonight they'll particularly kind of concentrate on uh, the Irish aspect of his writing and talk a little bit maybe about his own awareness of his Irish identity. I've put a link in our chat here on Zoom and those of you on Zoom, maybe if you mute yourself, you know, just in case you draw away, um, if you cough or something, the camera will go to you. But there's a link in Zoom for those of you there to purchase the book um, through SUNY Press's website. There's a 30% discount and I've shared it on Facebook too as a separate post, there's a, a code and that code is good for until May 21st. So um, without any further ado, because we're a teensy bit late, I'll pass it over to Daryl and Howard and welcome and thank you so much. We we planned on doing this last year, last March, and of course COVID put the kibosh on everything. So we're delighted we were able to re um reschedule and here you are uh you know live, just not together, <laughs> but with us. But yeah, thank you for coming and take it away. We're looking forward to it. Well, first of all, thank you very much. I want to thank Dr. Stack, the museum staff, and the museum for hosting this. And I want to also introduce the co-editor of the book, Howard Healy, uh, without whom this book would not have happened. He'll never take the full credit for it. Uh, and I wanna welcome everybody and thank you so much for honoring my husband's writing by your presence. I see many familiar names, faces, people I know, and I'm sure there are others watching on Facebook. Uh, so I wanna thank everybody for joining us. What we're going to do is First, um, Howard and I are each going to talk for a few minutes. Um, I know the most about how, about Jim's childhood and a little bit of what might have informed him to become so interested in the topic uh, of his Irish heritage and the great and newsworthy writing that was he was doing um, well into his career on this topic. Uh, Jim was a native Bostonian. He was raised in the Brighton section of the city of Boston. And that's a very, uh, or at least his part of that city, it's a very, I would say blue collar working class neighborhood. It was then, it's less so now, but it was very much when Jim was growing up. And he grew up in a very mixed neighborhood a uh, very diverse street. There was uh, there were people from Europe, people from South America, there were Asian families, a lot of working class families. So I think he got interested in his Irish roots in his teen years. He was uh, fully Irish on his father's side and a mix of German and Irish ancestry on his mother's side. Um, as Jim used to say, his ancestors came over during what he always called 
the Irish potato genocide. He never called it the famine. And he felt very strongly about that. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, he was a graduate of the Boston Latin School, which is the oldest public high school in the country. It's part of the Boston city school system. And so although he was living in Boston during the busing crisis of the 70s, when particularly violence broke out in the South Boston part of the city, uh, he wasn't directly affected by that because he happened by virtue of the fact that he was in Boston Latin School. He was already in what was probably the only actually integrated school in the city of Boston at that time because it was a special application high school and it drew students from all over the city. So he was surrounded by this, but not directly affected by it. Um, I think, and Howard and I were talking about this, I think the, the fact that Jim went through Boston Latin School may have actually been the thing that awakened his interest in his Irish heritage because that is such an old high school. Benjamin Franklin went to Boston Latin. He actually ended up not graduating, but he was a student there. That's how old that high school is. So it was obviously up and running during British colonial rule. And honestly, based on Jim's descriptions about it, the ones that are printable and repeatable, um, it was built very much, I think, on a model of uh, sort of an Americanized version of the English boarding school. Students stood up when they were declaiming in their Latin class. And it was built very much on a British sort of a headmaster system. So something about that experience, I think, woke up Jim's interest in his Irish heritage. And at the ripe old age of 15, my husband actually, with a classmate, organized a protest against the English presence in Northern Ireland, got a permit to have a demonstration and event on the Boston Common, which is the great public meeting space in the city. He wrote the press releases. Uh, they had a crowd of 1,500. They had speakers. And um, the fact that he did this at age 15 showed that something, something pulled this early interest in his Irish heritage to the forefront. So from there, Obviously, he went on to become a journalist. And Jim always said that the greatest journalists, in his opinion, were the Irish American journalists. He was a great fan of Jimmy Breslin, actually quoted something out of Jimmy Breslin's writing at our wedding in his toast to me. He was a tremendous fan of Pete Hamill and, of course, a tremendous fan of the co-editor of the book, Howard Healy, another great Irish American journalist and a far more accomplished journalist than I ever was. Howard has an extremely distinguished background uh, with the Wall Street Journal, the Times Union, and uh, a real, hmm? and the Louisville paper, a real old fashioned newspaper man. So I'm now going to turn the talk over to Howard who's going to speak a little bit more about the part he knows better than I do, which was Jim's work on particularly this topic of the Irish peace process and uh, how he formulated those pieces and what the reaction to them was. And then I'll be back later. Yeah, well, one of the great surprises that I had uh, when Jim joined the editorial page was to discover that some of our readers actually thought Jim was pro-British uh, <laughs> uh, with a name like yeah. McGrath. Growing up in an Irish neighborhood, Jim McGrath being pro-British, how could that be? <laughs> and some of our readers would complain whenever he wrote about uh, the Irish troubles. And that was because Jim was bound. The actually, he would look at both sides of the issue. They had the kind of uh, uh, narrow vision that we see today in American politics. You know, your guy can do no right, our guys can do no wrong, and you've got to be on the right side. Jim was too principled for that. He had a thorough understanding of the Irish uh, situation. The staff never questioned him because he was the authority. He knew. And when he wrote about it, if he saw a need to point to what was wrong on the Irish side, as well as on the British side, 
he had the courage to say it and he said it in a beautifully balanced way. And rather than just say that, I, I, I thought I'd read some uh, from one of his editorials that I think uh, is kind of a minor masterpiece, the, the way he handled uh, the topic. And it happened after they had reached the, uh, the peace accord. It was written in 1998. And uh, even though they had the accord, the violence continued. And there were two horrific bombings. And Jim uh, was addressing this. And in one, two, three, four, five, and in about uh, nine paragraphs, he wrote uh, superbly uh, of this situation. And I'll just read some of it too. And he begins with, in the lush but haunted land of Ireland. Now that only an Irishman could write such a beautiful line, the lush but haunted land of Ireland. Not even a historic peace accord can halt, halt the miserable act of burying the innocent victims of unyielding hatred. Beautiful sentence. And so Tuesday in the tiny Northern Irish village of Augur, and a priest from the Catholic parish praying for the savage car bombing in the nearby town of Oma, that it might mark the end of 30 years of unrelenting civil war. The Reverend James Grimes spoke of the great faith of Avril Monahan, who was 30 years old and pregnant with twins when she was killed along with her 18 month old daughter. Mm -hmm. There are 26 more victims Catholic and Protestant alike to pray for similarly. Is faith tested so severely anywhere else? Now that's a line that you won't find any other editorial. Uh, that was Jim's gift. It was just a month ago that there was reason to hope that perhaps Northern Ireland had come to confront in all its collective outrage, a turning point, the deaths of three young brothers from a household and family of both religions in a firebombing committed by Protestant terrorists had so many people aghast at the sheer magnitude of a new standard of horror in their midst. But the defectors from the Irish Republican Army are not to be deterred. The so-called real IRA is a movement that claims by best estimates, barely 100 people. It insists on continuing the very war that the IRA itself and its political allies in Sinn Féin wisely have abandoned. The real IRA's explanation for its terrorism is an unspeakably cynical one. To claim the real target was a, was a commercial one and that the deaths of civilians were unintended is revolting. In an attempt to, apolog to apologize for the carnage it has wrought is obscene. To declare now that such violence will stop merely underscores the ugly and irreversible damage this group already has done. What, what, what a beautiful uh, balance there. there. We have Protestant terrorism and we have an IRA splinter group terrorism. Total balance. And that's what would uh, sometimes encourage some readers mm -hmm. on one side or the other to call up and say, Jim, we're biased. How can you be biased when you look at the, just look at the facts? Sinn Féin leader Jerry Adams had denounced the OMA attack in the strongest of terms. A nationalist hardliner who has embraced and savored the victory of an arduous peace process knows perhaps better than anyone that there can be no turning back in Ireland. It is encouraging that the commitment to peace that it shared among Bel Belfast, Dublin, and London extends to a determination to crush the last bastion of pro-nationalist terrorism. Three times we're talking about terrorism. But it is crucial that any crackdown of democracy that prevails, even still in the wake of the ratification of the Good Friday Accord, that means no imprisonment without trial, even for suspected terrorists. It means never losing sight of all that has been won this year, despite two of the most heinous instances of deadly violence in recent Irish history. Such is the burden of Ireland's test 
of resolve and faith. It, it, that just uh, stayed with me as a, a brilliant example of, of what Jim was capable of. And uh, we were so lucky to have him. I don't think any other paper in the country would ever have an, uh, uh, an editorial written uh, with that such, uh, uh, such beauty. Yeah, thank you, Howard. Um, the piece that Howard just read also leads into some of the things I was going to say about the era. Jim and I were the same age. We were a few months apart in age. And um, so we both grew up hearing the same approach by American journalists toward the period that was known as the Troubles. Um, I vividly recall, maybe I knew I was going to be a reporter even back then in middle school and high school. I vividly recall always hearing the nightly newscast. There was a lot of reporting on the violence. And I always remember you never heard a reference to the IRA without it being called the outlawed Irish Republican Army. But you very rarely, and please understand, I'm not in any way speaking up in approval of the bombing campaign. It killed an incredible number of innocent people. But what you never heard about in American journalism at that time was the equally strident behavior of the Protestant factions and the Protestant paramilitary factions in Northern Ireland, who at one point killed more Catholic Irish in Northern Ireland than the IRA killed British soldiers. That's not exactly bragging rights or anything to be proud of, but it was very unequal balance. And there was, I believe, a very strong pro-British bias in the news coverage when Jim and I were growing up. So it's all the remarkable that he was able to take a very balanced view on this and write about it with such knowledge. He read a lot about it. I still have some of his books on the topic. And Howard's correct. He wrote in a very balanced way. He wasn't afraid to call terrorism what it was, no matter who was committing it. And yet I remember, um, I was living in Chicago when the Good Friday Accord, when, when it was realized that that spring in 1998, that the Good Friday Accord was going to happen. It, was, it, it had either just been ratified or was about to be. And Jim called me, um, he was so excited. He said, it's going to happen. It's unbelievable. I can't wait to write about this. And he was really thrilled about this. And that shows in his writing. Um, I wanted to speak very briefly also a little bit about some of the other pieces in the book because um, Jim's writing on Irish people, Irish Americans and Irish topics didn't extend just to writing on this very important topic of the peace accord. Uh, very briefly, how the book came about, um, I very much wanted to preserve Jim's writing in some way other than in the archives of the Times Union. Uh, Jim's been dead almost eight years, and I'm still very moved and very touched by how often somebody references him. I had a service tech come into my house a few months ago to do some work on my Verizon Wi-Fi, and he happened to notice wedding photos on the shelf in my living room, and he said, your husband was Jim McGrath, wasn't he? And I was like, how did you even realize that? He said, I recognized his photo, which had run in the paper many times. And he said, I really followed his writing. So it's very, uh, very rewarding for Howard and me to know that Jim's writing is remembered that way. Um, when we decided to pull this book together, we were like, where do you start? Because Jim had written over his lifetime, we calculated thousands of pieces and they weren't all editorials. They were op-eds, they were feature stories, they were, uh, occasional travel pieces, pieces that ran in some other Hearst newspapers. So to winnow down out of several thousand choices, we decided we better tackle it by topic. So the topics that we divided the book up into were Albany, of course, um, politics, and we divided that up into local, national, and international politics, social justice, 
journalism, Jim wrote a lot about some of the scandals going on in our profession at that time, uh, fabricated stories. There were a couple of big stories about that. And he wrote a lot about that. Sports, he was a rabid Red Sox fan. And the last section of the book called I'll Be Home, which contains some never before published material, including some things I found in Jim's desk. I had the only copies of them. They were personal essays. They were application essays for fellowships. And some of them were just beautifully written and we felt that they belonged in the book, but they didn't fit a traditional news writing category. So I'm very happy that those were captured in the book. Um, a couple of the other Irish topics that Jim wrote about, uh, there's a great piece in the book, Jim happened to be at a college football game in California and the Stanford University marching band did around, uh, for some reason did a spoof on the Irish potato famine. And Jim was so outraged at this that he came back and wrote an op-ed piece about it, a column that ran in the paper, in, the Hearst paper in San Francisco, and that's in the book. Um, I guess the other thing before I, turn this back over to Howard um, for his take on pulling the book together. Uh, there, is, there are a couple of pieces in the book uh, mm -hmm. about a, an Irish American named John O'Hara. And John was very proud of his Irish heritage. Um, it's a great story in Jim's career that he championed this man. He was a political gadfly who got on the wrong side of the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office in Manhattan, in, in New York City. And that was an old school democratic machine at the time. And this guy was a political gadfly. He got on their wrong side. He kept running insurgent candidates against um, the chosen favorites of the party. And he ended up getting accused and convicted of illegal voting. Um, the first person since Susan B. Anthony to face that charge in New York State. It cost him his law license. It sent him into a state of semi-poverty for the next several years. And he started on a long, long campaign to try to get his conviction overturned. Um, he did eventually, that happened after Jim's death. His conviction was thrown out when it was learned that witnesses against him in his trial had committed perjury. Um, with the blessing of the then district attorney, Joe Hines. So, the, you know, the theme of championing people um, and taking the side of the underdog was very much a part of Jim's writing. And that may also have been one of the reasons he gravitated to this topic of the peace process. Um, so I think Howard might have a couple of things to say about forming the book, and then I'm going to do a short reading, and then we're, we're going to take some questions. So you, uh, you mentioned the O'Hara. John O'Hara, yeah. The significance of Jim's uh, editorial on that is that uh, O'Hara had uh, trouble getting any traction downstate. The, the papers down there were not interested in that. They just saw this as a, uh, uh, a dispute between two uh, stubborn Irishmen. Uh, and it was a, a political in-house in uh, matter. It, it, and they didn't uh, pay any attention to it. They didn't give it any print. And O'Hara was at his uh, wit's end when he got up here in Albany because he, he had brought the case up to the Court of Appeals. That was his last chance to have his name cleared. And uh, by uh, Irish luck, I guess, <laughs> he crossed paths with Jim. And uh, Jim immediately saw, you know, that this was uh, uh, injustice. I mean, uh, uh, obviously, uh, uh, Hines had, uh, had used the law to punish somebody who had the temerity to challenge the political establishment. He didn't like that, sort of like what we might have, might have seen here up in the days of the Democratic machine. But at any rate, uh, Jim wrote a, a, a beautiful editorial on it, and I was always struck by the way he uh, concluded that editorial. And he's, he's talking about O'Hara here now. He said, his plight is one more reason why residency laws should be made simpler and enforced consistently. So now we're not talking about a, a spat between two Irishmen. We're talking about uh, residency laws 
that are weak and that can be used against people who uh, dare to, to uh, assert their independence from a political machine. The appropriate dismissal by the Court of Appeals of the case that's come to haunt Mr. O'Hara would allow him to go on with his life. Other New Yorkers to vote and run for office without fear of such prosecution. So now we have uh, an issue here that's really broad because it affects every New Yorker who might have, uh, have a desire to run independently of the uh, party in power. And Susan B. Anthony to stand properly alone in history. I love that last line. You know, Susan B. Anthony was the only one ever convicted under this law and it was used just to punish her for trying to get women's rights. So it's, it's not only an outrage that Jim's writing about, but he points out at the end, it's also an insult, an insult to history, an insult to Susan B. Anthony. And that is just uh, it's so typically of Jim. He sees things in a way that the ordinary editorial writer would never think of. The ordinary editorial writer would just say, hey, this is political uh, malicious prosecution. Uh, uh, it, it has to end, uh, do the right thing or something like that. But look at the way that Jim handled it. And, and, and he so carefully builds up his case. It's so layered, it's so uh, subtle, and yet it's, it's so stark. Very nuanced. Uh, he, he always yeah. nuanced and layered. Yeah. Um, but for the grace of God, go I is what he wrote. And, and there he is. There he Sorry, is. My, my name is John O'Hara. I know it says Vicky on the screen. That's my name after seven o'clock. So. <laughs> so I and I will also I will also say before I realized that was you, John. I was about to say John has remained. Um, and his lovely girlfriend, Vicki, have remained steadfastly in contact with me. I consider them my friends now, not just Jim's friends. And uh, John more than once said that he thought he had landed in heaven when he got in touch with the Times Union editorial board and realized the two guys running the show up here were named McGrath. Healy and McGrath. I and he felt like, okay, I'm set. I've got somebody that's going to understand. I'm down here in Manhattan. I'm used to seeing Jewish names on the masthead. And I opened the paper, and I thought I died and went to Irish heaven. <laughs> Healy, McGrath, it's like, pick what you want. I mean. <laughs> I'm going to, um, I'm going to. But Darryl, I, just, I, just, I just, I just want to say something. Uh, so Please Jim Comey. Not. So this, my name is John O'Hara. And uh, I kept in touch with Jim till the end and he told me a story and it prompted him to write editorials and that's what he meant by there there but for the grace of god go i jim was registered to vote from his apartment before he, him and daryl got married it was down the block from the bar rogan's right that that apartment he had the remember the bar rogan's in albany so he, there, no this is before he got married so when you got married and you bought the house he hadn't switched his voter registration over to the house and he was running into the polling place to vote like 10 minutes before it closed and as he's going in he realized he's voting from the address he's not actually living from it's it's a mile away it would have been morris morris street yeah 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 and he was like he's like his heart was pounding when he was voting and he's like my god it could happen to anyone <laughs> <laughs> because how often how often do we do that we, we move we move 10 blocks do you register we register to vote right away you usually keep voting at your same place but after jim wrote his editorial the daily news editorial board the new york sun editorial board and editorial boards read each other that's what i learned from that and this is before the well it was in 2001 but the first editorial board to write was the Times Union, and then the Daily News, and then in the same week, the Irish Echo and the Amsterdam News weighed in on, you know, and how often do you get that? The Amsterdam News and the Irish <laughs> Echo, I mean. <laughs> it all started with the Times Union and Jim. It all started with the Times Union. Um, I, am, I am going to, that's great to see you, John. Hang in with us to the end and ask questions, please. Thank you. I got one more thing. I got one more thing to read. 
and a little a little uh, as Jim would have said set the scene set the story up um, I can hear him saying that now in March of 1995 Jerry Adams on his first visit to the United States he got a he had to get a special visa for a very long time he wasn't allowed to come to the United States because he was considered a terrorist and who knows he might not have even denied that label, but nevertheless, he was not permitted to come into the United States until Bill Clinton, who took a very strong interest in the topic of the Irish peace process, exercised his presidential authority to grant him entry to the country. And it's very, very fitting and telling that one of the very few stops other than Washington, D.C. that Jerry Adams made was in Albany, which has obviously an enormous Irish immigrant and Irish American, Irish descent population. Um, I'm going to read a, a part. The piece is too long to read in its entirety. Um, Jim's beautiful piece, which is in the book, and it's called Preaching to the Faithful. But I can't, Howard knows what I'm about to say. I can't read this piece without telling you two stories that still crack me up about the day that Jerry Adams came to Albany. This was a big event. So there's a bunch of people from the newspaper going. And one of the things that Jim just it left him shaking his head was a very young reporter whose name I'm not going to mention because she's now at the New York Times. Um, and she came, she was assigned to cover this as a news story. And she came running up to Jim at the last minute as they're all heading out the door. And Jim was actually riding in the vehicle with Jerry Adams. I think he had been at the editorial board yeah, first. Yeah. So this young reporter, as they're all bustling out the door to get to the Hibernian Center, comes running up to Jim, pulls him aside, says, Jim, 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 quick, tell me, the IRA, that's a British agency, isn't it? True, true, I see Bill Ritchie crack it, true story. Um, the, other, the other part of that day that I just loved, it's Jim told, and I'm not going to be able to do Jim's incredible skill at mimicking accents. Jim could hear somebody once, and he had their accent, their voice, their intonation down beautifully. So I'm not even going to try. But the managing editor of the Times Union at the time, a wonderful guy named Dan Lynch, God rest his soul, he has since died. He was a big help to me too, after Jim's death. And I think you could fairly say Dan was a bit pompous at times. So he's in the car with, <laughs> with Jerry Adams, with Jim, with some other people. And Dan is pontificating about the, Irish, the Good Friday Accord, which was then being negotiated. It hadn't been ratified. And he's going on and on. He's talking to Jerry Adams as though Jerry Adams needed tutelage in this. And finally, Jerry Adams cut him off and said, you don't need to lecture me about the agreement or explain it to me, Mr. Lynch. I negotiated it. End of discussion. So. Uh, I want to read just a, an opening excerpt, and here go the glasses. Um, as I always say, I wasn't wearing glasses when I before I started writing books. Um, I'm going to read just a little bit of the sort of the set the scene part of this from the beginning. It's called Preaching to the Faithful. Sinn Féin leader Jerry Adams arrives at Albany's Hibernian Hall for a sermon of peace. That's the drop head. On an otherwise dreary Sunday night in March, Albany is Jerry Adams' town. First stop of the victory tour as the slogan on the t-shirts for sale is calling it. The crowd begins to gather outside the Hibernian Hall on Quail Street even before the doors are open and hours before he speaks. Adams is probably still in New York City at this point and the simple anticipation of a visit by the leader of Sinn Féin who two years ago couldn't even get a visa into this country will rival the event itself. It's an older crowd for the most part, and many people look like they've dressed for church. Lots of green, of course, green neckties, green sweaters, at least one green blazer worn by a fellow who looked more than a little bit like Tip O'Neill, and at least one green windbreaker worn by a fellow with a green cap that says Schenectady AOH. There's also at least one person wearing an IRA button. The beer, domestic in Guinness and plastic cups is flowing pretty well and nobody seems shy about smoking cigarettes. 
The banter runs from the practical to the casual to the mildly political. The wife of the president of the Albany Hibernians is politely telling a woman wearing a sash of the three colors that no, they won't be serving coffee later. Anyone driving will just have to drink responsibly. There's lots of, hi, how are ya? And a great night for Albany, isn't it? Someone else says, we're all Republicans, as in Irish Republicans, tonight. That's the opening of that piece. And it, it goes on to, yeah. yeah, Howard has a comment on that, yeah. Great, great here. The, uh, the ending. Whoops, whoops, whoops. Hang on. There we go. The ending, when Jim always had a way of ending an editorial that, that was unique and that would sum up the, the topic beautifully. And I, of course, with this piece here, you didn't need, need a photographer. You knew, you, you had a picture of your mind of exactly what happened. And so how does he get out of it? He's going on and on about, uh, uh, Adams wasn't saying anything newsworthy. Instead, Jim had the uh, foresight to put the camera on the Irish, the Albany Irish who came out to see him and had an almost reverential air towards him. So at the end, here's, here's the way he ended. In the corner of the room near the bathroom door, an earnest looking man says without being asked, a great night and a long time coming. Now that could be a throwaway line, but it just tells you, it sums up beautifully, the investment that the Albany Irish had in the struggles. Now they didn't suffer the way that their countrymen did over in Ireland, but they were as invested in the struggle as if they were uh, a, a fellow countrymen, and they were. Those are the kind of things that uh, you'll find in this book if you take, uh, if you if, if you uh, have some time to peruse the different pieces in here, you'll see the careful craftsmanship that, that Jim put into everything, whatever the topic might be. Thank you, Howard. Um, we will. We're going to take questions. Um, I will sincerely hope we can answer questions. It's a complex topic if there's any on the actual political process, but we'll do our best. Um, in the chat, you will find a link. Um, I think there's two different ways to order the book at a discount and you have a month to do this. So um, I don't believe there's any limit on the number of discounted books can, that can be purchased by one buyer that wasn't specified. So Certainly, if you are interested in a copy of the book, um, it's a good opportunity to get it at a discount. So, mm -hmm. And uh, if anyone has trouble with the link, you can certainly, I believe, contact Dr. Stack, um, or and certainly me also. Many of you know my email address, but um, Elizabeth can make it available, certainly to anyone who cares to uh, contact me for any reason. If you're having problems with the link, I've got a a good in with SUNY Press who published the book. Um, we'd love to take some questions if there are any. Um, I guess uh, go ahead and uh, throw throw them out if you have any. Yeah. And remember so to un Zoom people, you can unmute exactly and just ask and I'll monitor Facebook. May not be any questions. I know, this crowd are normally quite chatty. <laughs> Yeah, Meg. <laughs> All right. Thank you very, very much for a wonderful introduction to the book. I, I definitely want to buy it. Uh, was Great. Did, did you and Jim Daryl go to Ireland together? Did Jim ever visit Ireland? No, and it's one of my biggest regrets. Thank you for asking about that. We had hoped to get there. Um, we had a tentative plan. I have a nephew who is really Irish and actually was his nephew by marriage. He was actually an illegal immigrant in Boston for many years before he met my beautiful niece, Kate McGrath, fell in love and realized if he was going to stay here and make a life with Kate and they wanted to get married, he was going to have to surface. And that was during President Obama's administration. If you had to be illegal uh, and an immigrant, illegal immigrant in the United States at that time, Irish in Boston under the Obama administration was a pretty safe bet and it was not a cheap process. So Gary, um, who's now an American citizen, US citizen, 
uh, and his now wife, my niece, Kate, we had hoped to make a trip to Ireland with them at some point. Uh, Gary is from the Irish Republic, he's from Dublin. I have a personal hope of getting there on my own. And I feel like I sort of want to do that trip for Jim. Um, I will say I have still a small bit of Jim's ashes and that's one of the wish list trips I thought I might make and just do that little private ceremony there. Thank you for asking. As I've learned, it's never too late in life to do anything. No. So I, I absolutely believe I'll get to Ireland one way or another. It's a gorgeous country. I've always heard. Thank you. So, yeah. Any, any other, any other questions? That was a good one. Yeah. And Facebook people, if you want to type a question in the comments there, I'll see it. Um, I, I, yeah, I was struck by how, you know, kind of lyrical his writing was. Obviously I'm newish to Albany. I'm three years now. Um, but, you know, his writing on, on delicate topics like that's, you know, it's serious politics. It's, you know, one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist. And, and as you said, Howard, to be able to kind of straddle that divide, I think, um, with compassion for both sides, it seems like, you know, that that's a and I will say, you know, that last piece that you read, Albany was a, a very it still probably is, you know, very supportive of Irish Republican activity. We, you know, we have freedom for all Ireland up here. We had no aid. And so even to be able to walk that line in the Irish community, he may not have always been welcomed, you know, for that, we could call it objectivity, maybe. Um, if you wanted to speak a little bit more about that. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, I think that's because Jim was so so thoroughly uh, invested in the topic. Uh, he knew it uh, from start to finish, mm -hmm. but he never, never uh, would bend his principles to take uh, an unbalanced view. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something you don't find today. You'll find a lot of op-ed mm -hmm. commentary, and it's always one way. And of course, on TV, it's very apparent. You'll go to one channel, it'll be uh, all liberal, and the other will be uh, all uh, on the <clears throat> far right. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's no, there's no give. And and, and that's not uh, that's not the function of good journalism. Right. Who looks at the, at the issues. And if somebody on your side did wrong, well, you have to face that, mm -hmm. and you have to admit it. You have to uh, incorporate that into uh, in, into what you write. I I just I just don't see that uh, taking root. I think that we're going in the opposite direction in this country. I'm not on, on the Irish topic, but on, mm -hmm. on many political topics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an excellent point, actually, um, Daryl. Do you know how? He Jim would have felt about that increasing polarity in the news and even the kind of assault on, you know, fake news and, you, you know, and, and I think Howard raises an interesting point, opinion editing or opinion writing, you know, is important, but, you know, freedom of speech and, and incitement, there has to be a kind of a boundary, you know, and so I think that's a really interesting point. Yeah, I think um, I've been asked this before. And in fact, in a previous talk on this book, um, when Howard and I were being interviewed on WAMC, um, I addressed this point because that was during the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. And I said that, you know, I've often been asked, how would my husband have written about that period? What would his reaction have been? Well, first of all, as a journalist, it, you know, he I, I said then, and I would say now, he would have had a field day because his writing would have been very scathing, very incisive, <laughs> and he, you know, sort of, he didn't hold back under yeah. any circumstances. Um, I think he would still be in his writing as Howard has depicted him, very balanced. Mm -hmm. I think he would have tackled this topic of, you know, very partisan journalism um, by, I would say, often a more right-wing faction within our profession. And there are talented journalists at Fox News, okay? They do some good stuff, mm -hmm. but that what defines a journalist today is the term is often very loosely tossed around. I taught at UAlbany for 12 years and that was when blogging was coming into style and there were some significant 
court cases involving bloggers who were threatened or actually imprisoned for not revealing their sources. Mm -hmm. And so I would say to my students, okay, you want to call yourself a journalist, you're a blogger. Are you willing to go to prison if you won't fork over your source's name? Mm -hmm. And that to me is the hallmark of a, a real reporter, a real editor, a real journalist is, are you willing to go to prison to protect your sources? And you think that's a problem only in the rest of the world? think again, it's a problem in this country. It started during the Bush administration and we had a number of journalists threatened with or actually locked up for not revealing their sources, which is a personal code. You just don't do it. And Jim and I actually had this discussion. Would you be willing, we kind of wanted to know how each other felt about this. Would you be willing to go to prison rather than fork over a source's name? And both of us were, he would have fed the cats. So, no, no. But it's the stuff, you know, what defines a journalist? Well, right now, this country doesn't have a lot of bragging rights. We are showing up on lists that we never used to show up on, like the Society to Protect Journalists, for countries where it's now dangerous to be a journalist. Mm -hmm. And yeah, not Darryl, just Daryl, you know, I just one thing I like to say about the, the, uh, the, 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 the mainstream media, whatever you would call it on the uh, Irish issues. The only time that I can remember, how you probably would even remember, it's, it seemed the only time that uh, you really had mainstream media on it was probably, and I'm going off memory, I would pick a year 1981 with Bobby Sands. Mm -hmm. and the hunger the, strike. And the hunger yeah. strikes, because yeah. it went from one to another. And the media was covering it, you know, and you start to, which. Yeah, and the IRA actually didn't want the hunger strikers to do that. They, they no. actually had gotten a message to Bobby Sands that was not at the specific instructions of the IRA. They knew it was going to be a political relations disaster. Um, but you're right, it was covered heavily. I very well remember it. I remember when he died and there were several after him who died. I remember the hunger strike and the way Margaret Thatcher handled it, you know, couldn't have been mm -hmm. worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She well, I, I think also, and Howard can jump in on this if he wants to, but I think also apropos of what I was saying about Jim's inculcation into sort of a British tradition in his high school, this country has a long, very pro-British, pro-English bias. Yes. And when I taught my course at UAlbany, there was a, a section where we went into the journalism of World War II. And I think it was, you know, my students to this, to them, it was like the Peloponnesian Wars, trying to explain to them how World War II was covered by the US press. But if you broke it down, and my ancestry is English on my mother's side completely, going back quite a ways, but it is English. If you look at how many people, we were allies with England during World War II, but if you look at how many people the British Empire had killed in their colonies over the history of the British Empire, it probably exceeded the number of people killed by the Nazis. The difference was the British didn't have concentration camps with the sole purpose of trying to wipe out one ethnic or racial or religious group, but they killed uncountable, I would say probably millions in Kenya, in India, in Ireland, but we never looked at them that way. But there was very clearly a, a pro-British bias in this country, I think, and in our news coverage. Mm -hmm. So I said this once in a class where I, had, I forgot I had a foreign exchange student from England. Oh, you can imagine the after class discussion we had. <laughs> she did, she did yeah. not take kindly to hearing her instructor compare her countrymen to the Nazis. You yeah, had uh, Churchill right up there with Pol Pot, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it is really only recently that, you know, the world, not to mind England, but it, it is only recently that they're kind of grappling with that fallout of empire and colonization and, you know, colonialism. Uh, I remember reading years ago in Ireland, like that the English had actually invented concentration camps during the Boer War, and and some of the South Africans and the Boers yeah. were, you know, war deliberately kind of put into these camps, and it was a 
a precursor for what followed, you know. Um, and I think to, to your point, uh, one of the things that strikes me, and I don't know how it happened, or maybe it is a function sort of of social media and technology, but there seems to be a, an almost a concerted effort these days for particularly pundits to put forward their opinion as a fact. Uh, you know, and it's, it's bad enough when students do it or when, you know, me on my Twitter, you know, when, when we do it, but when journalists who are supposed to know better you know, giving their editorial comments at night and probably on both sides, although I personally agree more with one side than I do the other. So I'm less offended when that's I do it. Um, but, you know, it's an interesting thing that, that that they present their opinion as if it was the actual news as opposed to the commentary on the news, you know. And I think that's a very important that's distinction that, that yeah. these old style journalists, like you were talking Jimmy Breslin and, and yeah. Pete Hamill, you know, that day is gone, it seems. Maybe well, print should, journalism is a little bit better than, than TV, you know, journalism. There should be a separation between the news section and the editorial. Yeah. There should yeah. be. But as you point out, and you're right, many times you'll see a story on page one uh, yeah. of the New York Times, and it will take a very uh, uh, opinionated view. Yeah. You can do it in the right, uh, you can look in the Wall Street Journal, and they'll have uh, the right far-right views of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you, what you are getting is opinion and not fact. Mm -hmm. and unfortunately, we have now the new uh, people making up their own facts or they, mm -hmm. they have the right to their own facts mm -hmm. and fake news. And yeah. I can just imagine what Jim would write an editorial on when Trump called the press the enemy of the people. The people I know. Yeah. I don't want to imagine that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I would love to have in secret. In the yeah, yeah. Well, we had a lot of spirited discussions at home and, um, you know, I, I will say, I know we're getting close to the end of our time. Um, Jim's neutrality is all the more commendable because honestly, he was not a fan of the Brits as he called them. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've all read or heard reference the famous quote from the IRA commander after the bombing of the hotel in Brighton that almost killed Margaret Thatcher. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, but we only have to be lucky once. Margaret Thatcher is going to have to be lucky every day for the rest of her life. <laughs> I won't say that Jim approved of, because that killed innocent people in that hotel. Yeah. Certainly he was, yeah. you heard his writing, he was appalled by the bombings. But he did feel that there was a lot to answer for and it hadn't been fully covered in this country. I know he felt that, so. Uh, John, do you have a question? You unmuted yourself, I think. Oh, I was just um, interested if, if Daryl could talk about what led uh, Jim to, into journalism and then what led him into being an opinion writer as, a, as opposed to being a, a reporter. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, he got interested in journalism. He must have gotten interested in it in college. He attended a very small, good private liberal arts college, Lake Forest College in Lake Forest, Illinois. I do not believe he had any involvement in the newspaper or student publication at Boston Latin School. But honestly, I have a feeling the um, relaxed atmosphere of the college newsroom. And I've actually been in the newsroom on that campus. That was a place where you could hang out and have a lot of fun and get away with stuff. Do you know more about what well, led him into it? Actually, was frozen back. Yeah, his father was a printer. Oh, of course. Yeah, I'm forgetting grew, that. He grew up in a household yeah. where the morning paper would be out there on the table before they went to school. And he could read about all the uh, the scores and the different game, baseball games, football games, or whatever. And then he'd go to school and he'd be like the authority. Every, he, he, people would wonder how, how he had all this knowledge. Well, he had the early edition. I mean, it was in, in their blood, I think. And, and his brother, of course, mm -hmm. went into uh, the New Yorker. He was in journalism. Yeah, my brother in law was at the New York Times for many years. His sister had a uh, She's a radio producer. I think she was in uh, on, broadcasting. Well. Yeah, and, and one of the NPR affiliates. Well, the other one didn't have the newspaper broadcasting. He became a 
I, uh, it's a it was an yeah, and I don't know how I forgot that, except that I was thinking more of college. Um, I know Jim used to also reminisce about his dad making. He would his dad was what people outside of the trade would call a typesetter, and actually his father's career was destroyed in a series of crippling strikes as that profession became automated. And that skill of being a typesetter or printer in a newsroom in the in the press room became obsolete. But his father used to, on Jim's birthday, take blocks of type and print a little personalized birthday card and bring it home to Jim, which he loved. And um, the, those those strikes in Boston where his father went from having a solid union job to not knowing where he was going to go from one day to the next. He was on a per diem, like being called to see if he had work that night. Um, Jim thought it contributed to his father's early death. His father died at 57 of a heart attack and Jim always felt that it was partly the, the stress. Mm -hmm. As far as becoming an editorial writer, um, well, Howard will know more the, about uh, that. Well, Jim was on the topic. Um, Howard, you're just fading out a little bit. Can you come closer in? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Jim was uh, on the copy desk at the time, too, and he was so good at that uh, that they didn't want to move him into the uh, editorial page. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of those things where you're trapped by your own skills. Yeah. He really wanted to do it, and he would write uh, occasional op ed pieces. pieces. That we would run. Yeah. But then there was uh, there was an opening. And of course, he put in for it, but they were there were all kinds of oh we don't know we don't they were giving him the stall okay, so they put an ad in editor and publisher, uh, that's the uh, new, newspaper's uh, uh, trade publication and all the job job openings are usually listed there, and they wanted an editorial writer. They didn't say what the paper was. They put a blind ad in. They thought they'd get some candidates. Well, they did get some candidates. And one of them happened to be Jim. And his uh, writing just stood out from all the other candidates. And finally they said, well, okay, we'll give him a chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he loved opinion writing. He didn't want to be just on the desk. <laughs> Although he was a crack editor and he could mm -hmm. spruce up a column uh, that would make the uh, columnist uh, work even better. Yeah, and my husband with an opinion, my gosh, that's amazing. I'm shocked to hear how it say that. Uh, Judy on um, Facebook just kind of commented that she's reading Say Nothing by Patrick Radden Keith, and she's getting to the Good Friday Agreement section and Jerry Adams, but actually we had Patrick Radden Keith speak with us, you know, two or three months ago, and he was talking too. Of course, we got into the Boston College and the archives and all of that, and uh, we were talking about the importance of protecting your sources, you know, so it was good to hear you talk about that, Daryl. Yeah. And does anybody else, Jean, or anyone online have a, a question or a Facebook? I'm still monitoring you. Well, I'm just wondering if he had any trouble from as an editor from the owners of the paper. Did mm -hmm. they uh, push back on him on any of his work or try to hobble him in any way? Um, they, they would, but not on that topic. Uh, they, they, everyone in the building understood that Jim knew the Irish uh, issue inside and out uh, and, and and his writing proved that he could handle it in a balanced way now they thought it was an imbalance that maybe you get some pushback but not not on that topic but on other mm -hmm. topics uh political topics yeah if your publisher disagrees with you or your top editor disagrees with you then you have to have a meeting of the minds and decide which way you're going to go mm -hmm. <laughs> more than a majority yeah, 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 more like yeah. committee, right? I, I do remember we're getting close to the end of our time. Um, and this is a great question. Um, there's a piece in the book that Jim originally wrote as an editorial, and he recrafted it when his editor, Joanne Krupe, felt that it would be better as an op ed piece. Um, we had a spate of really awful violence in Washington Park. This goes back about 25 years ago, because Jim and I were not married when this happened. And Jim had actually been mugged and beaten up pretty badly one night in the park on a, a primary election night. He was 
taking a shortcut through the park to get from one campaign headquarters to another. He was jumped and beaten up by three kids. And this was, he thought he might get killed. He thought it might be a matter of political right. And in fact, a few months later, there was that kind of killing in Washington Park where two young kids were mugged, forced to kneel, and they were executed at point blank range a few hundred yards from where Jim had been mugged. And it was a gang initiation, right? So the kids that mugged Jim were caught. They all served prison time. I mean, they ruined their lives for $50. And Jim wrote a really compelling piece about Washington Park and what it means to the city. <clears throat> that piece is in the book, but he was overruled on writing a very neutral, you know, a compelling but more neutral editorial on that. And it turned into an op-ed piece that I think is incredibly powerful because he really recounted those few minutes of terror where he had given up his wallet. He was, you know, Jim was a big girly guy, but these were three tough young strong kids. They knocked him to the ground, knocked his glasses off, and he very was like, take my wallet. They were still beating him up. So then at that point he thought the next thing they were going to do was pull a gun out. And he was terrified. Yeah. So um, anyhow, um Elizabeth, I know we have we have we are we are at the end of our hour. Um yeah we're never very good at uh obeying time <laughs> this thing so if you don't have a comment or or a question i'm happy to uh, bob says thank you for sharing your insights yeah that's a lovely comment thank mm -hmm. you and they're, they're very um appreciative on facebook too you know it's a lot uh, to talk about and think about you know uh, sorry about the loss of integrity in journalism today so people are engaged uh, still but if anyone here has any last comments we can Finish it up. Thank you from Jean. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just offer one last comment and Howard is welcome to all. So Howard and I were talking before this uh, event began tonight. We were very, very honored to have this done. And as I indicated at the beginning of my talk, um, the fact that there are so many people who still care about Jim and who remember his writing, that means the world to me. I'm still in the house that Jim and I lived in together. Um, and it's difficult still for me in some ways, in a lot of ways, but this kind of event has been, uh, you know, the, the outpouring still and the, the great care that Albany had for Jim is very meaningful to me. So I'm really appreciative. Um, he would be both very pleased, very touched, and he would probably think he absolutely deserved it. So. <laughs> <laughs> he was not modest. Yeah. I, I thought you were going to say that he felt he didn't deserve it. And, no, yeah. no, no. He would, he would want even more. Oh, good, good. Yeah. Jim often felt that he didn't get the recognition he deserved. That he deserved. I think, I think one of the reasons that is, uh, he wrote for the wrong media in the sense that a newspaper is something we just read for the moment, and read for content. And then you uh, you move on with your daily uh, work. Yeah, I, I have to say many many times when I was in the editorial department, I did the same thing because I was always thinking, well, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. You don't have time to really sit back and contemplate it and look at a piece of writing and see how carefully structured it was. But when I was putting together this book, reading these uh, editorials over and over again, I was just struck by how carefully crafted. Uh, Jim's work uh, is, and that's why it stands up so well in this book. And if you have, if you have time and you don't have a deadline uh, uh, hanging over your head, and you can read and just give a little reflection to it, you know, all the uh, all the qualities will jump out at you. I think it's a it's a, a beautiful book, as one of the tributes said on the cover. Yeah, we were also lucky to have quite a few people as contributing. Um, they wrote tributes about Jim, so each section of the book opens there's a beautiful foreword uh to the book written by rex smith the former editor of the times union we had a lot of help uh and as i said howard has never taken enough credit for the book but at first he was just my behind the scenes go-to person howard what about this piece what about that piece and finally i said howard you're going to be co-editor and he said not me and i said well then i'm not doing the book unless your name is on the cover so yeah um, well, here's one of those tributes that 
comes that I can see. Then well, the news day is talking about passion for journalism, this passion for fairness, this passion for truth. That's that pretty much sums up Jim yeah. and his writing. That's fantastic to have all those, you know, plaudits still from, from colleagues and, and maybe even rivals, you know. Um, yeah, yes. I think that's a, that's a, a testament to him, for sure. We, we were very happy with how the book came out and credit yeah. goes to SUNY Press for beautiful design, yeah. really great editing and um, working with us. It was a book that had to be published by a local publisher. Mm -hmm, so. mm -hmm. So and for those of you who came in late, I, I said um, I, I did put a discount in the chat here on Zoom and I shared it as a separate post on Facebook. But if you miss that or, or can't find it, just email the museum info at irish-us.org and I'll email you back out the link. Uh, it's good for a month. So, um, yeah. Thank you. So thanks, everyone. I, I think, um, you know, this was fabulous. I, I, it's great to have an insight into a community like Albany, you know, so the, the small Albany side of things, you know, as, as well as the larger um, Irish American kind of community and, and how that ties into international news and stuff. And then to be able to hit on where we are today, you know, I love these kind of organic conversations where you don't know where it's going to take us, you know, but um, I appreciate all of you joining. And I would encourage you again to vote early and often for the Irish American Heritage Museum in the <laughs> Culture Awards in the Irish Echo. Um, it, you know, that's voting is open until Friday. And we have next Monday, we have um, former state military historian Robert Mulligan is going to give a talk about the military aspect of the 1916 Rising. That'll be also on Zoom and Facebook. And actually on Saturday, we're going to read the proclamation to celebrate the 105th anniversary. And we have some local American Irish legislators coming. Uh, the mayor is coming and we'll have some music from Tris Gailey, uh, to kind of commemorate that. It'll be quick, you know, we're, we're not going to be there all day, but quick at 11 o'clock in the morning. And then on Wednesday next week, we have Larry Kerwin from the band Black 47, who's written a fantastic novel about an Irish American family and their experience during, you know, 9-11. So, um, and then we'll talk about May next week. <laughs> we have a full program in May as well. So uh, thank you all for joining us. I'm delighted to see some new faces here tonight. I hope you get in touch with the museum. John, we'd like to probably have you give a talk, I'd say, <laughs> at some stage. And, uh, or Vi alias Vicky, I mean. <laughs> so, um, you know, definitely uh, thank you all for joining. And, and thanks to the Facebook people. They're all saying hello. And it was truly fabulous. And uh, I appreciate it. So we'll we'll be in touch. And thank you both, Howard and Daryl. I think this was Thanks, lovely. We appreciate Howard. it. Thanks, yeah. everybody. Thanks, Howard. Thanks, Daryl. Mm -hmm. John, I'll be in touch with you, Mr. O'Hara. Thank you, Howard. Good seeing you. You're looking yeah. good, Howard. Everybody. And Take good care, night. everyone. Good All right. Night. Signing thank off. You. Yes. Thank you. Bye bye. That was fabulous. Thanks, guys. You too. <laughs> bye bye. Thanks, Elizabeth. Bye, not at all. Bye bye. <laughs>